How's it going, hockey fans? This is episode 91 of the Clapper Cast. This is the, our first playoff edition of uh, the season. And I'm Burke, and as always, joined by my co host, Sean. Sean, it's playoff time. I'm pumped. How are you doing? You know, I'm I'm struggling right now. I'm I'm wrestling with what exactly do we call this episode because it's not really a preview because you know pretty much we every series the is underway. <laughs> yeah, it's not a review because they're still happening, so it's just like a playoff view. Yeah, we're recording this on the 18th <laughs> of May, and there's been uh, you know obviously a few games so far. The, the Canadian teams haven't started yet, so at least we can get a quick preview in on those ones. But um, yeah, I mean we can just still walk through. We had a prediction that. Uh, or uh, you wrote a blog post on our website, clappercast.com, and put our predictions in there. So we did get them in before the playoffs started. We didn't get to have an episode before then, but at least, you know, we, we have it in there, what we what we thought would happen. So for posterity's sake, it is, it is recorded <laughs> before the start of playoffs. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got these predictions in. We're not just being sleazy and changing them two games in once uh, the team we picked is going down, going down to nothing. <laughs> yeah. So let's just take a, you know, kind of a walkthrough about what we, why we kind of gave our predictions and we'll kind of uh, talk about the, the storyline so far early on here in some of these uh, for the, the series that are underway. So let's start out west, the Colorado Avalanche versus the St. Louis Blues. Colorado Avalanche were the President's Trophy winners with the best record in the NHL. Most points, they wanted I on guess. a tiebreaker. Yeah, they they want they didn't even have the most points technically. They wanted on a tiebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> so first time I think since oh six oh seven with the Sabers and Red Wings, I believe. So definitely a great season. I think that I was I was they were kind of expected to be good, um, and it's just kind of you know between them and Vegas, really, who's gonna win that division and and, and get it. Um, so, uh, what, what's your prediction for this series? Despite what Ryan O'Reilly thinks, uh, the Avalanche are taking this pretty easily, <laughs> in my opinion. I've got I've got the Avalanche in five. Um, St. Louis was extremely average the entire regular season. They managed a negative goal differential. Um, you know, Jordan Bennington, the goaltending situation in St. Louis, we kind of thought they might struggle a bit. They didn't do great. Um, and Bennington last year's playoffs was a massive letdown with his 851 save percentage, 472 goals against average. So... You know, I think game one, what did Colorado win 5-2? Uh, I think it was 4-1. 4-1. So close. You're being generous. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Colorado kind of... They, they they just have more finish, I think, than St. Than St. Louis, and it's going to be a lot easier for Colorado to, to take it pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I went with Avs in six for my prediction. I think that just the... You know, the veteran presence of the Blues, they've been a team that have won. They, they might get a couple games here. Um, but the just the power that the Avalanche have up front. And they've been really good defensively this season, too. Like, let's not um, take that away from them. But they've actually been, I think they're one of the top teams in the league for for um, goals against as far as, you know, the, lo the, the lowest in the league. Um, and they've had a lot of injuries you know, they've, Eric Johnson hasn't played at all. He's a you know a top sixty man, top forty man for them. Um, but they've had really good goaltending. Um, you know, they, they brought in the worst goalie in the league, <laughs> Jonas Johansson, <laughs> and uh, he's he's looked good. And um, Grubauer, you know, big fan of him. And uh, Burakovsky's got getting hot at the right time. And um, you know, they they just look like that that they're ready to go for a, a pretty deep run. And so I think that yeah, the Avalanche are going to come out on top and. In game one, you know, they came out ready to play and showed that, you know, they've got the scoring power. And McKinnon, I think, had a few points. And Landis Cog had a Gordie Howe hat trick. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a great sign early on that your, your best players and your leaders are that engaged and creating that much energy. Yeah, and they, they, they really look like they're – they came to play and they came to win. And I think you're right that, uh, you know, um, Ryan O'Reilly might be a little disappointed at the end of this one. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a photo of him in the locker room, not taking his gear off like there was when he played in Colorado. Um, so maybe, maybe there's that. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of a weird note that the St. Louis blues, I think they're one of two teams that only use two goalies all year. Um, I, I can't remember who the other one is, but, um, yeah. And I mean, like Bennington has, hasn't been as, uh, you know, crazy as his rookie season, but 
Yeah, I gotta but go he's with Yaz. crazy in a different way because he's trying to start fights with everybody already. Yeah, and that's in in game <laughs> one he 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 skated all the way down the ice because there was a bit of uh, fireworks at the end of the game there, um, and it was in the Colorado end, and Grubauer was pushing someone out of his crease, and uh, Bennington skated down. The ref got in the way and kind of it, it just seems with him it's always that like hold me back, bro, like, hold me back, let me at him, you know, that sort of thing, where it's like he never yeah. actually does anything. He's always just, like, trying to be tough, and it's like, all right, I guess that fires people up, but, like, it looks really dumb <laughs> in my opinion. It, it, <laughs> you know, at least he's trying, at least he's trying to get the energy, like, get some momentum swing, like, something going, but, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of one of those, like, all bark, no bite type situations, I think, until yeah, something he, actually he, happens. Yeah, I think he's, he's probably lucky that Dubnik wasn't in net, because I think Dubnik would have just gone <laughs> right for him, but. I don't think Grubauer is the, the fighting type. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're both kind of in agreement. A little difference in the num- an amount of time that it'll take the Avalanche to to win it all there in that series. But, um, yeah, I mean, got to go with the Avalanche. They're kind of the favorite for, for the Cup in my mind. Um, and then so next up, you know, Vegas. They are up against the Minnesota Wild. And this is an interesting one. Um I actually went with the Wild in seven on this one because I've just been a fan of, uh, you know, the Minnesota Kaprizovs all all season. And, um, you know, in the last few games where they played Vegas, they ended up coming back and and winning. And, um, you know, Minnesota kind of had that, um, I don't know, kind of that that playoff mindset almost, you know, kind of all season where – they just came back. They weren't ever out of a game. And, um, you know, in game one, they ended up winning 1-0. And it was a real goaltender duel. Cam Talbot was amazing. And Fleury made some unreal saves. Um, shout out to Fleury for playing in his 15th consecutive playoffs. I think that's the first time any goalie has ever done that. So that's amazing for him. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that uh, I had to go with one kind of major upset, and uh, this was it, and I really hope the Wild can, can do it because I also, you know, just my bias is I hate Vegas. So, so I would like to see the, <laughs> the super teams that, um, you know, have the, the salary cap issues. I would like to see them lose. Um, so you're telling so. me the team that can only dress like 15 skaters in a game is having salary cap issues? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, although I will say that Vegas is not as egregious as another team that we'll talk about in a minute. But um, so that's not where my like dislike of Vegas is. It's just the fact that you know they're they're so good. <laughs> so what did you yeah, say so for this one? I I just see Vegas. They they just have the stronger, more experienced, and just better roster. I mean, tied with Colorado for the most points in the regular season, goal differential plus sixty seven in the regular season. It's just they have so much strong or such a deep strong team that i find it hard to see minnesota being able to take them down however the interesting note and the thing that you know kind of supports your your foresight of potentially an, uh, seeing an upset in this one uh, vegas had a 3-4 and 1 record against minnesota in the regular season and despite the team's overall plus 67 goal differential against minnesota that was down to plus 1 like a 24 to 23 uh, goals for or goals against for Vegas in the season series against Minnesota, which is kind of an interesting one because it's such a stark contrast to their performance against the rest of the division um, in the regular season. Now they also got to feast on you know San Jose, Anaheim, and Los Angeles, but you know for for our, that type of record, it's it's showing that it's going to be a lot closer than maybe I think it'll be. And that that first game, I mean, a one nothing overtime game. Like that is, you know, that, Playoffs, that's going to tell us like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how close is a series going to be? Are we going to go, you know, one goal games all the way down to game seven, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, I mean, like just how Vegas struggled against the Canucks, you know, that, that series went to seven, I think last, uh, last year in the bubble. And, you know, they got up against a hot goalie and couldn't really solve them, even though they have so much firepower, they have so many weapons on that team. And so, you know, I really think that Minnesota has a real shot at, at, you know, upsetting them because Vancouver got close. And, um, you know, Vancouver, I think, was probably a worse team than Minnesota is right now. I mean, I don't know. They're probably, probably actually pretty comparable. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, this is just a hopeful, hopeful 
um, yeah, prediction on my end. But yeah, I mean, the game one kind of spoke. It's going to be close. It's going to be close for sure. One other quick thing of note is that we know over the last few seasons, uh, Minnesota has been, you know, more or less let down by their goaltending in uh, Devin Dubnik basically just underperforming despite the team being one of the best defensive teams in the league they just didn't have the goaltending to really make them shine so this year they've got I mean Cam Talbot's been good and uh, Capo Kakonen has been good as well in that and uh, that could be you know are we seeing what the Minnesota Wild roster is supposed to be you know a kind of a top tier potential contender or are they just overperforming but either way you know they're kind of playing more in line with where their stats and where their you know, play style and uh, underlying numbers might indicate. Yeah, the last few games of the season, I think they played against the Blues to wrap up their season, Minnesota, and they really didn't look very great, and they lost, I think, back to back against the Blues. But you know, in that game one, they they were competing. It was they had lots of shots. They were were in that game, and um, you know, got some net presence, and ended up getting kind of a, I don't know, just capitalizing on a mistake um to try and clear the puck and then um you know had a got a lucky bounce off of martinez's skate and that went in so you know i mean that's always the key to, to beating a good goalie is to just get traffic in front it's not rocket science it doesn't take you know yeah. a, a huge amount of um you know individual skill to do that and so you know teams yeah. can really capitalize on that if they're able to um so yeah, yeah i mean wild too. seven for me but uh uh, the thing with that too is both of these teams are very very stingy and neither of them give up many scoring chances i think they're both like bottom five bottom ten in the league in uh scoring chances given up or should i say top in in terms of least um, least amount so all it's going to take you know you just have to keep pressuring and you're going to have to find a way to generate those lucky bounces those random those random chances because you might not be able to get very many high quality ones yeah so we'll move on to the central division i forget what the sponsor is it's like honda or whatever discovery or mass mutual or i don't know what <laughs> which one whatever one it is the central um so the carolina hurricanes versus the nashville predators um what was your prediction for this series hurricanes and four um this this is my sweet prediction my main one i just i don't really know how nashville made it into the playoffs it's kind of a because dallas sweet, didn't <laughs> yeah they, they squeaked in because a whole bunch of teams were kind of middling to average throughout the regular season. Nashville had a hot streak at the right time and got them a couple extra points. Um, they, I think the Predators, and just looking, they were like one of the worst. They were tied for the least uh, amount of points in the regular season for a playoff team or something. Yeah, and they ha also think um, they had like their leading scorer, I think it was Yossi. And had like 30 points or something and it was the league lowest for a team leader on a team and there is i think seven skaters on carolina that have that or higher point totals yep <laughs> um and um, <laughs> so it's like okay you know, you're kind of mismatch here unless you have a yeah soros has a god tier series that's gonna be it i mean this, the Predators were a team that everyone was like, oh, they're going to be selling off at the deadline to rebuild. Then Saros turns his game around and it kind of, you know, energizes the team enough to get them on a couple of decent streaks to get them into a playoff spot. You know, that's that's basically it, is they're going to be relying on UC Saros to be absolutely unreal and somehow manage to beat the two unreal goalies that Carolina's icing this year with Mrazek and uh, Nedeljkovic, who have, like, just absurd numbers with like a two goals against average, nine twenty five, nine thirty save percentages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also went with a hurricane sweep in this one, and um, you know, not not to take anything away from the Nashville Predators because they fought and, and got into the playoffs, but I really think that they really got in because Dallas didn't, and Dallas had like fourteen overtime and shootout losses and they they really think they lost a bunch in overtime to nashville and so that really made the difference in who could make it um and dallas you know they had the shitty start to the year and yeah anyway so not to like just say that it's they made it because the other team faltered but like 14 overtime and shootout losses like that is such a huge swing and uh i just think it's such a huge mismatch here um, yeah. 
and you know, I went with Minnesota in the last series, and it is a bit of a mismatch. But in this one, it's like, no, Minnesota was a good team during this. Minnesota regular was one season. of the, you know, they finished third in that division. They were still kind of, they were only a few points back too. They were still higher, and they were way higher up in the standings than Nashville. Like they could have been like second in a couple divisions, I think. Yeah, it's just this one is just like that. That in the yeah. central, it's just like those top three teams are really strong, and then Nashville or whoever made that fourth spot, it's just you know real really big underdog. And yeah, um, you know you mentioned that the goaltenders for the Canes, um, they ended up starting Nedeljkovic in game one, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, and they ended up winning like like five two. Um, so um, you know they're they're kind of their scoring talent took over. They were able to kind of control the pace and it was at home and they actually had a full capacity arena, which we haven't seen yet until, until that point. And so that was did also they go full or did they just cram 12,000 people into the lower bowl? I think it was full. I don't know. Either way it was, uh, they had, they had the most people that's been in there. Yeah. Either way it was, year. a I, it was really cool to see, um, you know, kind of a, packed or as packed as it could be arena um and um you know regardless of the COVID situation whatever um that was really cool and so you know feeding off of that um was probably a huge part of it too um so yeah i mean it looks yeah. like the hurricanes are on their way to to you know do some damage but you know they don't count the predators out you know maybe um they get some more goal scoring and stuff but that's kind of been yeah. their struggles they, they scored a lot more when forsberg was out for a long time and then when he was in the lineup and when he's back they haven't been scoring as much which is strange you uh you mentioned earlier about um carolina controlling the pace so much in that first game and that's that's the key to their game is that carolina just plays such a fast-paced action high event game that the only way nashville is really going to have a chance is if they shut that down like uh like has happened against carolina in the playoffs a couple of years in a row here um, Nashville's got a very elite defense. I mean, it's led by Roman Yossi, Matias Ekholm, Ryan Ellis. Like, these are all top-end defensemen, and uh, even though, you know, Yossi and Ellis have very strong offensive capabilities, they're going to have to band together and slow the game down so much to disrupt what the Hurricanes can do and just don't let them play that, that game they need to if they want to at least keep it close because at that point it turns into the same thing I was talking about with Vegas and Minnesota where it's just few scoring chances you just have to find a way to create a lucky bounce yeah yeah they've, they've got some solid um defense for sure um but they've also got a pairing of good branson and ben harper and so like they're ge they're monsters but <laughs> like <laughs> i uh, I, I think the like speed those, of those carolina yeah yeah those top three are in, i mean whoever plays with whoever plays the other spot on the second pairing if it's fabro maybe um yeah, I think I don't know if he was in for game one, but I can't remember. Yeah, but they've, uh, they've also those, got like you know, Matt Benning as a as a sixth yeah. seventh guy, and um, so, so I feel like those top three are going to be ending up playing twenty five plus minute nights. <laughs> yeah, probably you're probably right. And I think they got Borowiecki, but I think he's on the IR right now too. Um, so I'm not sure what his status is, but um, if he's able to come back, maybe his physical play makes a bit of a difference. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, the speed of Carolina is just, you know, I don't know if Predators are going to be able to, to, you know, defend against that. And that we kind of saw that in game one. So, yeah, I mean, our, our predictions are the same on this one, uh, the, the one sweep I predicted. Uh, so we'll see if that happens. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Hurricanes fan. Um, so for me to, you know, go with them just shows that they're just such a, they're just such a strong team. Um, and so next up in the central, we've got probably the matchup of the first round that most people are excited for. Is I have to agree with you there. The Florida Panthers versus the Tampa Bay Lightning. And it's surprising that this is the first time that this matchup has ever happened. It's exciting, though. With, with the lack of times that Florida's ever made the playoffs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit less surprising. <laughs> But, yeah. I mean, they did have both of the teams in, you know, the early 2000s had a couple of decent years around the same time, I think. So it is it is in its own way surprising that they've never managed to match up like this in the playoffs. And it's been, you know, 25 years for them. So 
uh, pretty pretty big story. And like you said, matchup of the first round that both of these teams are just so strong. So um, how are you feeling about this series? Well, I I mean, again, I, I feel like I'm just saying which teams I like and which teams I don't like. But I don't like Tampa. I've never liked Tampa. And I went with the Panthers in seven. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the Panthers matched up extremely well against Tampa all season. Um, and I just, you know, with the, the additions that they made at the, you know, throughout the season, I think that, um, you know, they have a really good shot at winning this first ever Battle of Florida. Um, but that being said, um, you know, they got to they gotta stay out of the box um, because Tampa Bay has got Nikita Kucherov back and Steven Stamkos back. And this is what we were alluding to earlier with the, the, you know, the salary cap thing. It's just extremely suspect that Kucherov is, you know, had the quote unquote mental fortitude to, to be able to come back and will himself back into the game in time for game one of the playoffs. Um, exactly. You know, when, when he's been the salary cap doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. When he's been skating and practicing with the team for weeks and they just didn't have the salary cap to bring him back so it's just like they totally circumvented the cap and for that reason i it's just one more reason to for me to not like tampa bay and i want the florida panthers to win um and you know the calgary flames fans have been kind of shitting on sam bennett for a long time because of you know his play during the regular season and he, he showed up big for them in playoffs last year you know that lucic dube bennett line but I think te- uh, Florida fans got a bit of they they kind of understand why Calgary fans have been um, you know upset with Sam Bennett because he looks great for for periods like he did at the end of the season for Florida, and then in game one he is basically the reason that they lost that game um, because he took three penalties I think and or two maybe two um, but on both of those power plays. Tampa Bay scored because their power play is scary now with Kucherov yeah. on one side, Stamkos on the other, Hedman, you know, they've got a scary power play. And so you have to and stay out of the box. And to even more, Bennett got himself suspended for game two. Yes. Yeah. For, for boarding Blake Coleman, I think. With, with a completely unnecessary hit. Um, yeah. You know, just to so. totally agree with that one is a dirty hit. Um, and I think Florida fans are kind of upset because, uh, or at least online anyway, um, that, um, you know, there was a boarding call earlier in the game where McDonough boarded Duclair from behind. But, you know, he he also didn't take, like, the entire width of the ice to, to skate at the guy and paste him into the board. So, you know, agree with that suspension. And, you know, it's just aggravating because Sam Bennett is an important part of that offense now. Um, and he takes himself out of the game. And, and also, yeah. he took that penalty at the end of the game, um, when it was a tie game, I think, and they went out and scored, and so it's like, man, you gotta, you got, like, it wasn't even a borderline play. Like, it's like that's always gonna be called. It's just stupid, just a dumb, dumb, reckless play, and he, you know, Quinneville's got to be just leery at that decision. Yeah, so that's just, uh, yeah, that's just like really poor decision making game management for Sam Bennett to, to be taking so many penalties game one of the playoffs getting yourself suspended on unnecessary hits you know he's such like you said he's such a key role player for that team you know like that with with him Duclair and Verhage being so versatile in that forward group to be able to jump up and down the lineup and play in wherever and contribute in so many different ways you, you got to be you got to be playing smart and you cannot be giving a team with the firepower of Tampa Bay any Ex- any extra chances to score yeah that's just it's just and such a such a bad look yeah exactly game one was exciting as as you know all hell um it's, it really is going to be you know the series of, of round one to pay attention to so what did you go with for your prediction on in this one i i lean the lightning in this in this it's going to go seven games it's going to be a long series i think but um i just i can't see florida being able to take out Tampa Bay and the depth that they have um yeah and and you know the 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 re-addition of Nikita Kucherov conveniently missing the entire regular season coming back for the first day of the playoffs you know 
the NHL investigated and found no evidence of cap circumvention, but um, they didn't technically break any rules. I just find it interesting that they, the recovery time for the surgery is exactly the length of the regular season. Yeah, and they hinting, were... Hinting that I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of delayed or scheduled the surgery to fit that timeline appropriately. It's, yeah, for me, it's, it's you know, that... That probably has happened before for injuries and stuff, but just the fact that they used that amount of cap space to sign, re-sign Braden Point, Mikhail Sergachev, guys and that Sorelli, they, pro- I think. they and, yeah, and Sorelli, so guys that they probably would have lost, you know, and so it's just aggravating because it's like, you know, they're and they're, now they're, they're playing eighteen million over the cap in in yeah. the playoffs. You know, they have so, an extra eighteen million of of roster on their team, <laughs> so they're essentially like, you know having their cake and eating it too because they they were able to keep all these other guys and then they get all these guys back for for playoffs and then you know if they end up going and winning another cup and then they have to you know trade guys off or whatever or do whatever it's like yeah it was totally worth it um and you know whatever but you know I, i really look forward to them getting knocked out and to for them having to be in a real cap bind for next season because it's just it's just so frustrating It'll be happen. interesting to see because with with the backlash and the outcry that's been, you know, uh, that's been happening with the Tampa Bay Lightning situation, it'll be interesting to see how the NHL alters the rules on LTIR and cap space to see, you know, maybe they stop doing things like um, Tampa Bay trading for Gabarik and Nilsson, Anders Nilsson from Ottawa just to get the LT- extra LTIR space to bring in more guys. Um, maybe they start applying the cap into the playoffs as well for certain situations or, mm-hmm. you know, have to play a certain amount of regular season games to be playoff eligible. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the solution is. I just know that it, f- it feels wrong um, for this to be <laughs> totally okay. Yeah. You know, like it just seems like it, it, it's it, sus. Yeah. It's extremely just questionable. And, um, you know, for a, for a player of the, the caliber of Nikita Kucherov, you know, a guy who won, you know, um, the Art Ross, um, to just <laughs> come in and yeah, like oh, <laughs> we're just adding him to our team now conveniently yeah, for game know, most, one. We yeah, thought he would be. Most teams have their <laughs> and they were most like oh black aces. <laughs> yeah, we've got Kucherov. Um, yeah, black aces like random AHL guys coming up for a couple of games here and there, but now we got Kucherov. <laughs> yeah, and they were like just the audacity for the team to be like oh the mental toughness for him to come back. It's like obviously they're not gonna like admit like yeah we. We did we did this to you know cheat basically, yeah. but um, it's like oh yeah we originally thought he'd be ready for round two, but he's ready for round one. It's like yeah because you realized that round one was a tough matchup, and so you you know you 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 were able to get him in. But it's like yeah the the playoff there's no salary cap, so it doesn't matter. But yeah it's just it's just so annoying that that they're able to to just get away with that. But you know that's that's the salt just coming out, but um. Yeah, I mean, we both kind of have the same um, length of time in this one. Just kind of we we go opposite directions, and I think I really leaned into the I don't like Tampa Bay and what they're doing, and um, I want them to get knocked out in the first round and have them issue another, um, you know, we know you don't want to hear it, but <laughs> sort of <laughs> sort of email like when they got eliminated by Columbus, and you know maybe maybe Kabrowski can you know have that magic happen again where he was part of that Columbus team that swept. Tampa Bay, so maybe he's still got that kind of magic in him where he can, you know, be, beat a good team. The man who single-handedly ends franchises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we'll move on, I guess, to the, uh, you know, division formerly known as the Metro, um, where the uh, division-leading Pittsburgh Penguins um, ended up matching up with the New York Islanders. Um, so for this one, um, Again, you know, I, I, I'm a Capitals fan. I don't like the Penguins, but I had to go with the Penguins in six. Um, I just think that the Penguins really surprised a lot of people this season winning that division. Um, they had a lot of injuries. You know, they Malkin was out for a significant amount of time. He's still out. Um, and they've just got so much depth, and they've had some, some great goaltending from Jari. Um you know, at times I thought that they looked like they were going to be in trouble with the goaltending, but uh, they ended up kind of turning it around. And um, just a lot of uh, secondary scoring, and um, I just think that uh, you know they're 
it's Crosby. It's Crosby, and he's going to be, you know, doing everything he can to win. And in game one, he had an absolutely gross one-handed tip. And so, um, yeah, Penguins are up one to one game to zero. They're currently winning in game two right now. Um, and so I think, yeah, just uh, had to give the, it to the Islanders. Him. Islanders won game one. Did they? Yeah. Oh yeah, Palmieri. Palmieri. Palmieri in overtime. Yeah. My bad. My bad. Yeah. I so guess so. Isle, Isles up one nothing. Penguins winning game two yeah. halfway into the second. Yeah. My mistake. Yeah. Totally right. Um, went to overtime, so at least the Penguins got the the point, right? So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That'll help them in the long run. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was a you know a close game, obviously in, in overtime. Uh, Palmieri had two goals. Yeah, it's all coming back to me now. There's just so much so much going on. Um, <laughs> but I mean, regardless of losing game one, um. You know, I just you can't count Crosby out, and um, I th- I still think that they'll uh, they'll do it. So, where did you uh, line up on this one? So, despite the fact that I'm always one of the main uh, people saying when Crosby and you know when he's healthy, Malkin are on the team, you can't count the Penguins out. Um, I lean the Islanders in seven games in a long series. You know, the Penguins have such a strong offensive team. I think they yeah they were second in goals for in the regular season. They only won behind Colorado. You know, they've got Gensel, Rust, and McCann all with excellent performances. You know, Gensel at 57 points. McCann was injured for a bit, but he had 32 points in 43 games. And even Kasperi Kapanen had 30 points in 40 games. That's a really strong showing from some of the depth scoring. And it's going to give them the versatility they need to, you know, continue to pilot on the Islanders, who are a very stingy team. They don't give up much, but they don't generate a lot either. Um, you know, the, the 128 goals the Islanders had is second lowest in the league but they were still really good, really strong because Varlamov and Sorokin had excellent seasons in net and the Islanders just play a very strong shutdown game. So I think over the over the length of the full series, that might squeak out a couple of extra games for the Islanders, but um, it's, it's going to be close and I would not be the least bit surprised to see the Penguins' offensive firepower just be able to you know, generate that one extra goal per game that they need over the over the full series. Yeah, it's just it's just always so tough to go against the Penguins just because of Crosby. <laughs> but yeah, I mean the Islanders have beaten the the Penguins before. I think it's two two seasons ago. Penguins lost in the first round to Montreal last year. So you know it's definitely possible to to knock them out. And so I would love to see them get knocked out. Um, but I'm I'm still going with the pittsburgh and in uh six um and then i guess uh, the last american matchup uh to talk about is the washington capitals versus the boston bruins this series is currently at one one uh two overtimes um and it was the opening matchup of the playoffs and as everyone wanted to happen tom wilson got the first goal of the playoffs um so great job for wilson um, my prediction um, as a Capitals fan was Bruins in seven. And my thought process for this is, you know, one, I think the Bruins are a better team going into playoffs than the Capitals. Um, and two, I want to, to go against the Capitals so the Capitals win. <laughs> because if I go with the Capitals, then it's, you know, I feel like I would have a big head and I'm expecting them to win and I don't want to be that. So I'm going against the team that I like so that they win. So it's not that I want them to lose. I just feel like if I go against them, they have a better chance of winning. Um, so that's <laughs> that's my reasoning for that. Um, but like I said, I really do think that the Bruins are a better team coming into playoffs. They've they had, you know The addition of Taylor Hall has been just great for them and the addition of uh, Mike Riley um, has been um, really, really positive for their blue line, and they've they've got um, you know some of their blue liners coming back. I think they had Brandon Carlo back um, at the end of the season. He's been playing again, and so you know I think that they're just kind of getting hot at the right time. Um, have a you know a really good top six. Um, you know the Capitals are were without Kuznetsov coming into the season or to the series. They they were without um, Ilya Samsonov in net going into the series as well and so you know it's just it wasn't a great uh position for the team they they you know obviously uh drama going on with the Tom Wilson thing right at the end of the season as well so um a lot of distractions for the team coming in and you know it was just 
kind of in a, a weak spot coming into that series. And so Boston is just kind of poised to, you know, take it, I guess. Um, so where did you uh, go on this one? For, for a similar reason that I think the Bruins just have a bit of a stronger, deeper roster, I take the Bruins in six in this series. Um, you alluded to one of the main issues with the Capitals roster right now with Kuznetsov and Samsonov out um, on the COVID list, but they are also dealing with major injuries. Um, Ovechkin missed most of the last couple weeks of the season with a groin or hamstring injury or something. Um, John Carlson missed time with an injury of his own. Nicholas Backstrom got rested to help recover with something. TJ Oshie was a question mark going into the series. Um, he's back and he's contributing already, but all these guys are already hurt and going into the playoffs. And that's, you know, over the course of a, a deep playoff run or even just a longer series, could it could end up with players being sore, tired, underperforming. And then, you know, in game one, Vitek Vanacek gets hurt. So I think, did Craig Anderson start in game two? Yes. Is he? Okay, so, you know, they're down to their third string goalie already. And the Bruins are rolling with Tuka Rask and Jeremy Swayman, who's been a bit of a breakout as their backup goalie this season. So I just see the Bruins with the, with the stronger roster, the healthier roster, being more likely to be able to take this one, to be able to wear the Capitals down. Um, you know, one of the issues with the Bruins last season that kind of led to their downfall was a bit of a depth issue that they couldn't really generate anything once Marshawn, Bergeron, and Pasternak were a bit under or weren't performing. You know, they they got blown out by the Lightning in that in that series. They were losing by multiple like three, four goal games. So they've got now a second line where Taylor Hall, um, he had fourteen points in sixteen games on that second line with David Krejci and Craig Smith, who's been on fire the last couple weeks as well and just to give them that extra line to match up against the capitals offense it'll be it's showing that it's working i mean two close games into overtime already and uh i think the boston bruins are just a bit stronger a bit healthier and probably a bit more poised to take the series yeah i mean the good news for the caps is that uh, ovechkin you know came out all guns blazing in game one just absolutely destroyed david krejci with a hit and so he's looked really good um, he's looked fast, um, and you know all those guys are, are playing. Kuznetsov and Samsonov were taken off the COVID protocol list, and so you know I, I don't know if they're going to be coming back in. But um, you know Craig Anderson uh, turns I think forty soon, and he's you know had a lot of shots, and he's looked pretty good, um, especially for a guy who's made like you know two or three starts this season. And so um, you know, but. Yeah, it's not a great place to be in to be using that third goalie, but, you know, Anderson is a guy who's played a lot of, I think he's like fourth of current goalies for, um, yeah. you know, playoff overtime wins or something like that. And so, anyway, yeah, he's played a lot of to hockey. his advantage, yeah. So, you know, he's he's an experienced goalie. I mean, he was, he was Ottawa's goalie in that uh, surprise run to the conference final a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that he's been able to rest and just kind of practice and not, not overwork himself during the regular season, you know, bodes well for an older goalie who needs to step in in, uh, in an important time here so you know he's been he was solid in game games one and two so that's um hopefully hopefully a sign of things to come for him but yeah and um just a just a note on the Vanacek injury is that I think Kelly Rudy had the absolute worst take all season and it was really disrespectful to both Vanacek and um Craig Anderson on the Sportsnet panel, it was just an absolute joke. He said that it was Vanacek's, or he opened the he opened that segment saying, "I guess I'm supposed to feel f sympathy for Vanacek because he's injured," and then he went on to blame Vanacek for not stretching properly and injuring himself. And pro athletes don't get injured like that, and it was just fucking ridiculous and made me really mad and um, just like. Yeah, I mean, Rudy literally burst a button off of his suit jacket from being too fat earlier in the season on a broadcast. So it's like, if you live in a glass house, don't throw rocks, bro. You you didn't, you know, you played in the 80s and 90s and, you know, guys didn't know what stretching even was then and had, like, you know, beers and smokes on <laughs> in intermissions and stuff. So it's like, yeah, give me a break. Like, shut up. Like, and then, you know... Ovechkin had a muscle injury at the end of the season that you mentioned. You know, no comment on that. And groin pulls and, and hamstring injuries are the most common injuries in goalies. I mean, Tuga Rask has been out uh, for that, you know, same reason some parts of this season. And so it's like, you know, Carey Price, you know, if it's just a, it's not a 
you know, superstar goalie, so you're just going to talk shit about him. And I was really disappointed that absolutely nobody on that panel said, that's a stupid take. How can you say that pro athletes don't pull muscles? Like, I just it just enraged me. It was so stupid. Like, an absolute joke. Oh and, my God. and there's the salt segment of the episode. <laughs> well, it's just, I mean, like, I don't know how you can it, ever play a... sports and, you know, agree with that. That, you know, yeah. things happen. It's a rough you, take. You push yourself, and it's just like... This is an absolute garbage The thing is, all take. it takes, it, it doesn't matter how much stretching you do, all it takes is one awkward movement where you put something at an angle, you know, a couple of degree angle that it isn't used to, and it's, you know, push off the wrong way, and you can pull your groin, you know? Especially yeah. for a goalie going back and forth across the crease, it could happen without even, make, without even overdoing it, overextending. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's how hard is it to say that exact thing? And you, as a goalie, you'd, you'd figure that he would know that, yeah, sometimes you make a crazy, try and save something that beats you and uh you know you pull something and you know you don't have to be a dickhead about it and say that it's his fault for not stretching properly it's like you know do you think that you honestly think that someone making their first ever playoff start in the nhl is going to not properly prepare for that now you rolled out of bed ate a junior chicken and (laughs) hopped on the ice (laughs) yeah it's like that's 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 laughable like come on like you know that the trainers aren't gonna let that happen they're gonna be working with him to try and do everything they can to get him you know mentally and physically ready for the game and you know they go out for a pregame warm-up and you know they have a you know game day skate and everything like that so it's like it's just like that was just such a i couldn't believe it when he said that i was like are you are you for real <laughs> like oh my god it's it's, it's the clickbait segment of uh of trying to get people to watch the show <laughs> yeah and it's just like luckily like i went online and like everyone was just kind of in agreement that was like this is a really bad take and i cannot believe that sportsnet employs people that that think that way and um it just kind of reminded me of some of the other guys that they've they've had in the past and you know just how how stupid they are and maybe they're you know instructed to do that but it's just like come on man <laughs> it's a really bad look so anyway yeah i mean getting over that saltiness it's not even about you know anything to do with the game it's just that was really stupid and it makes me not i I actually haven't watched any of their intermission stuff since i've just been you know flipping to other games or whatever and it's like i don't really care what kelly rudy thinks you know the guy who has a stupid rap song about when he (laughs) played hockey um so yeah weird but um you know i really hope the capitals can can take the series but boston looks like they're they're poised to kind of go a little bit further for sure. Um, and I guess we'll move into the uh, the North Division, and I'm saving one team for last year, um, but uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, so division winners, um, they are matching up against the Montreal Canadiens, and that is what everyone wanted. <laughs> yeah, first time since, what, 1976 or something? Oh, it's, it's... It's been so long, and this is, like, this is a historical matchup. You know, this this one goes way back to the origins of the NHL, English Canada versus French Canada, the Toronto versus Montreal. It's so historic and such a big deal to see these teams in the playoffs. It's going to be a fun series. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that the Florida-Tampa Bay series is probably going to be the series of um, the first round. But if it's not that, I think it's going to be this one. You know, it, just because it's, you know, just the amount of hatred the fans fandoms have for each other and you know just there's so the much amount history. of coverage it's gonna get it's gonna be <laughs> yeah. like t- like sportsnet roger like they're gonna be pumping oh it's the yeah, airwaves it's, with constant like you know rivalry fueling material it's everything they one. dreamed of they wanted this they wanted yeah. this so bad it's um, a producer's wet dream <laughs> it, exactly yeah so um what was your uh prediction for this one well, ultimately, uh, the the Maple Leafs have a much better roster. The Habs kind of squeaked in near the end of the season. They're kind of one of the worst teams that made the playoffs. Um, so I lean, I lean Maple Leafs in five on this one. And I'm That's in total a, agreement. Yeah, I mean, the stars are kind of aligning for the Maple Leafs. You know, win the division. They don't have to face Boston right away. You know, Matthews, Rocket Richard winner with 41, I think 41 goals. I don't know if he scored in the last game. You know, Marner with 66 points. You know, they're both top five in scoring. And and the main criticism of the Leafs over the last handful of seasons has been, you know, they're all offense, no defense. But the Maple Leafs were about seventh best in goals against per game this season. So, you know, they're, they're a top 10 team in that. And, 
you know, for all the people who are saying they don't defend, like, you've got evidence that they do this year. They have been this year. Their goaltending's been fine. Um, once they've kind of finally kind of found someone to, to take over, they've kind of rotated through a few guys, and that's kind of the question mark is kind of who's going to stay hot. Is it going to be Jack Campbell all the way through? Is it, you know, is Anderson even going to be the backup? Because that was a question, too, if, if he was going to be in a battle with David Riddick for that backup spot. But, um, you know, Jack Campbell took over the starters role for the end of the season. Looks like he'll be the game one starter for the Leafs. And, you know, Montreal kind of, you know, their, their best players are, are coming off of injury or they're already injured. Like mm-hmm. Dano, Gallagher, Carey Price have been have been out with various injuries. They might have some of them back for that game. Um, Shea Weber had a thumb splint on, so he's been playing injured for a bit here. So we've got a lot of a lot of question marks in terms of roster health, and that could uh, really hamper their abilities to to counter Toronto this this series. Yeah, but they have Corey Perry. True. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe. He'll, he'll just go and uh, skate through skate through Jake Allen's glove and then have it be a good goal anyways. Yeah, I mean, Corey Perry was really great for the Stars in playoffs uh, last year, and so, you know, maybe he can you know, bring back that magic and, you know, provide some timely goals for the Habs. Um, but, yeah, I went, or I went with uh, Maple Leafs in five again. I think that they're just so much better at every position. I mean, you can argue on goalie if Price is even coming back, you know, where where the better goaltending advantage is. But, um, you know, he he has been, been great at times this season. And so I don't even know if he's going to start. I mean, both him and Gallagher practiced and played the last game of the season for the AHL team. Um, I don't know how that went for them or if that's happened yet. Um, but, you know, they're, they're trying to basically get back into game shape um and you know to have your 10 million dollar goalie or whatever it is he makes to not be kind of questionable for the start that's not a great place to be in um you know i don't know but um i just think that the the toronto maple leafs have made some really smart additions you know they've got nick felino um who was just an absolute playoff grinder battler um and i think that they're just going to be in a really good place in this series and just their their offense and their offense ability is just going to be i think overpowering for the the Tro- or for the montreal canadians and you know one interesting storyline is kind of um you have josh anderson and nick felino so you got the the columbus former teammates battling it out here so we'll see how that goes um but yeah i, I just think that toronto's too strong i would love to see it go seven though because um or at least six, because it came out today that uh, the Montreal Canadiens have, uh, I think, tentatively approved for uh, 12% fans in the arena for Game 6 in the Bell Centre. So if that can happen, that would be awesome. Hopefully hopefully we're both wrong and we can actually see some spectators <laughs> in a Canadian arena in the first round. Yeah, um, it's only if that would be awesome. not, it's not very many people, but... Uh... I mean, Habs fans are going to be loud. <laughs> yeah, they'll make like, up for the they'll... empty seats. <laughs> It'll feel like there's 15, 18,000 people there probably. Yeah. And last but not least here, um, I know it's probably the one that you're most excited for, uh, Edmonton Oilers versus the Winnipeg Jets. So um, I'll let you have the last word on this one. I guess I'll be selfish and go first. Um, I picked the Oilers in seven. Um, and I mean, just thinking about it now, I think that might be too many games, but, um, I really think that the Oilers are gonna, you know, kind of go away with this one, but just by the fact that they're the Oilers, they might have let a few games get by them. (laughs) Um, and, uh, but I do think that they're gonna, you know, come away with it. Um, whatever happens in this series. Um, I just think that they're, you know, their power play is so good. Um, and they've, they've actually been getting some really great goaltending from, um, uh, Mike Smith, who I think, um, really should win, um, the, uh, what's the award called? The, um, Masterton. Masterton. Yeah. I really think he should win that. Um, and, um, you know, if, if all their top players perform, I think that they, you know, have a, 
really good shot at winning and I just think that they can blow by um, Winnipeg's defense and uh, they've you know throughout the season they um, stacked up really good against Winnipeg Winnipeg was up at or above 500 against every other team in the division but Edmonton um, and Winnipeg also really sucked to end the season and uh, you know they're, they're coming into playoffs really really slow so that that's you know kind of sucks to come back from but maybe the intensity of playoffs you know boots them back into gear here but um you know unless connor hellebuck has a absolutely outstanding series i really think that it is the edmonton's going to come out on top so um, now that i pumped up the edmonton's tires where do you uh sit on that one pretty much in the same boat like you mentioned the key point is that winnipeg basically was falling over themselves into the playoffs they end of the season like 2-8-0 or something and that was including a couple of games against Edmonton that they got stomped <laughs> um, whacked, McDavid yeah. and you know Edmonton as a whole was good against Winnipeg overall but McDavid and Dreisaitl specifically I think uh, they had m the most points against Winnipeg than any other team in the division this season like just though like th their production was more against Winnipeg than every other team in the division so as long as they can keep that up, then you know they've got a guaranteed three goals from those two every single game. The tricky part for Edmonton is going to be depth, as always. Um, most of the team's impact and success goes through McDavid and Drysaddle. You know, McDavid, I think, f had fifth had a point on fifty-seven point eight percent of Edmonton's goals this season, and that was like the highest number since you know the nineties or something around uh, around Yager and Lemieux, I think. But um, luckily this season, you know, a few others, like Ryan Newton Hopkins had a decent season. Darnell Nurse was solid offensively and defensively. Um, Tyson Berry had a great offensive year. He's up in the point-per-game range, and, you know, they had goaltending from Mike Smith. So they, they were able to get contributions from other players, um, other lines, like they had been rolling Tyler Ennis and uh, Jujar Kara with um, Josh Archibald. They were an amazing third line for a little bit during the season, just generating so much pressure and chances that uh you know, it's such an improvement over other years where it's just nothing happens when mcdavid and dry aren't on the ice so you know we've, we've kind of seen edmonton struggles with high pressure games they kind of have those stretches where just nothing works and that you know we saw chicago take them out in the play-in series last last season and that's kind of the concern going into this one where winnipeg doesn't have much of a shot really their defense doesn't match up the you know the depth doesn't seem to really match up either on Winnipeg right now but all it's going to take is Connor Hellebuck going on a hot streak to shut McDavid and Dreisaitl down and suddenly you know, it doesn't take much for Shifley, Wheeler, Ehlers, Connor, I mean Kyle Connor I'll specify to <laughs> you know get a couple of easy goals on Edmonton when they have one of their random defensive lapses. Um, I think ultimately the Oilers take this one in six games um, going off of just how the teams have been playing and just Edmonton's going to be hungry. They, they think they learned their lesson from last season. And now that all these guys have another year of experience, another year where most of the team stayed together, there wasn't a whole lot of turnover from year to year that I think they're kind of building up that, that core of that core group, that chemistry that it's going to take to propel them a bit deeper than, than they've have been in the past. Yeah. I, I think Edmonton's just, you know, if their offense is churning, I think it's just going to be too much to uh, for Winnipeg to handle. So similar to the Toronto Montreal series, where you know just the production that can happen in the you know the top top six or and for Edmonton top three, um, you know, depending on which line their recital is on. But um, yeah. well, going going off of how the last playoffs went. Uh, Drysaddle and McDavid got split up, especially against Anaheim, and that made it really, really difficult for the other team to match up because they aren't able to split up their best defensive players to cover two amazing lines like that. And that lets, you know, they, they focused on shutting McDavid down, but that left Drysaddle with a better matchup, and he put up a ton of points in that series. Um, so it'd be definitely in the Oilers' best interest to split them up and run two, potentially even three lines of with offense if you want to throw Nugent Hopkins on his own line for a bit. But I think uh, if they want to go Nugent Hopkins, Drysaddle, Yamamoto as a as a line, that one's got past success, and it also helps them split up, um, split up the thread a bit, so that they aren't able to get shut down as a one line team. 
Yeah, and then if that power play is clicking, it's going to be really hard for Winnipeg to, you know, come back. They just keep taking penalties. Like, if they, yeah. keep tr- if they like, trip up Connor, because it's, like, whoever's matched up against him, um, you know, they're going to take penalties just trying to stop Connor McDavid, and that That's really plays the, uh, into I the mean, hands of the Oilers just so. D- it depends how the how the rule book is called, because you've got <laughs> Connor, you've got the McDavid rule book, you've got the playoff rule book, and then are we going to see the Connor McDavid playoff rule book? Yeah, I mean, I think he's he's gonna draw calls. It might not be he, you know like everything, to... but just his speed and his ability to just yeah. like embarrass guys. I think he's just gonna you know guys are gonna be clutching and grabbing and trying to do whatever they can to prevent him from getting around them, and or otherwise he's just gonna go down the ice and score. So it's like I guess you just risk it to get a power play because at least then you've got a better opportunity of stopping it. But you know if it's between that taking a penalty and letting Connor McDavid get a breakaway. It's like, I think you know what, <laughs> you know, yeah. most defenders are going to do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just think that the Oilers, uh, you know, just be- based on their, their track record of, you know, kind of letting some series get away on them. And you know, like you said, the the Chicago series last year, um, I think that they'll, it'll probably go longer than it should, but um, the, the Oilers will, will end up taking it. That wraps things up for this time here on Clappercast. Make sure you rate and review this episode and toss a follow or subscribe our way. For more content, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Clappercast Media or on Twitter at Clappercast. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll be back next week with more Hockey Talk.